Chapter One of Mount Royal, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mount Royal, Volume Two by Mary Elizabeth Braden. Chapter One. Let me and my passionate love go by. That second week of July was not altogether peerless weather it contained within the brief span of its seven days one of those sudden and withering changes which try humanity more than the hardest winter with which ever transatlantic weather prophet threatened our island the sultry heat of a tropical tuesday was followed by the blighting east wind of a chilly wednesday and in the teeth of that keen east wind blowing across the german ocean and gathering force among the pentlands angus hamley set forth from the cosy shelter of hillside upon a long day's salmon fishing his old kinswoman's health had considerably improved since his arrival but she was not yet so entirely restored to her normal condition as to be willing that he should go back to london she pleaded with him for a few days more and in order that the days should not hang heavily on his hands she urged him to make the most of his scottish holiday by enjoying a day or two salmon fishing the first floods which did not usually begin till august had already swollen the river and the grills and early autumn salmon were running up according to donald the handyman who helped in the gardens and who was a first-rate fisherman there's all your end tackle upstairs in one of the presses said the old lady you'll just find it ready to your hand the offer was tempting angus had found the long summer days pass but slowly in house and garden albeit there was a library of good old classics he so longed to be hastening back to christabel found the hours so empty and joyless without her he was an ardent fisherman loving that leisurely face-to-face -face contemplation of nature which goes with rod and line the huntsman sees the landscape flash past him like a dream of grey wintry beauty it is no more to him than a picture in a gallery he has barely time to feel nature's tranquil charms even when he must needs stand still for a while he is devoured by impatience to be scampering off again and to see the world in motion but the angler has leisure to steep himself in the atmosphere of hill and streamlet to take nature's colours into his soul every angler ought to blossom into a landscape painter but this salmon fishing was not altogether a dreamy and contemplative business quickness presence of mind and energetic action were needed at some stages of the sport the moment came when angus found his rod bending under the weight of a magnificent salmon and when it seemed a toss-up between landing his fish and being dragged under water by him jump in cried donald excitedly when the angler's line was nearly expended it's only up to your neck so angus jumped in and followed the lightning swift rush of the salmon downstream and then turning him after some difficulty had to follow his prey upstream again back to the original pool where he captured him and broke the top of his eighteen-foot rod angus clad himself thinly because the almanac told him it was summer he walked far and fast overheated himself waited for hours knee-deep in the river his fishing boots of three seasons ago far from water-tight ate nothing all day and went back to hillside at dusk carrying the seeds of pneumonia under his oilskin jacket next day he contrived to crawl about the gardens reading burton in an idle desultory way that suited so desultory a book longing for a letter from christabel and sorely tired of his scottish seclusion on the day after he was laid up with a shark attack of inflammation of the lungs attended by his aunt's experienced old doctor a shrewd hard-headed scotchman contemporary with simpson sibson ferguson all the brightest lights in the caledonian galaxy and nursed by one of his aunt's old servants while he was in this condition there came a letter from christabel a long letter which he unfolded with eager trembling hands looking for joy and comfort in its pages but as he read his pallid cheek flushed with angry feverish carmine and his short heart breathing grew shorter and harder yet the letter expressed only tenderness in tenderest words his betrothed reminded him of past wrongdoing and urged him upon the duty of atonement if this girl whom he had so passionately loved a little while ago was from society's standpoint unworthy to be his wife it was he who had made her unworthiness he alone could redeem her from absolute shame and disgrace all the world knows that you wronged her let all the world know that you are glad to make such poor amends as may be made for that wrong wrote christabel i forgive you all the sorrow you have brought upon me it was in a great measure my own fault 
i was too eager to link my life with yours i almost thrust myself upon you i will revere and honour you all the days of my life if you will do right in this hard crisis of our fate knowing what i know i could never be happy as your wife my soul would be wrung with jealous fears i should never feel secure of your love my life would be one long torment it is with this conviction that i tell you our engagement is ended angus loving you with all my heart i have not come hurriedly to this resolution it is not of anybody's prompting i have prayed to my god for guidance i have questioned my own heart and i believe that i have decided wisely and well and so farewell dear love may god and your conscience inspire you to do right your ever constant friend christabel courtenay angus hamley's first impulse was anger then came a softer feeling and he saw all the nobleness of the womanly instinct that had prompted this letter a good woman's profound pity for a fallen sister an innocent woman's readiness to see only the poetical aspect of a guilty love an unselfish woman's desire that right should be done at any cost to herself god bless her he murmured and kissed the letter before he laid it under his pillow his next thought was to telegraph immediately to christabel he asked his nurse to bring him a telegraph form and a pencil and with a shaking hand began to write no a thousand times no i owe no allegiance to any one but to you there can be no question of broken faith with the person of whom you write i hold you to your promise scarcely had his feeble fingers scrawled the lines and he tore up the paper i will see the doctor first he thought am i a man to claim the fulfilment of a bright girl's promise of marriage no i'll get the doctor's verdict before i send her a word when the old family practitioner had finished his soundings and questionings angus asked him to stop for a few minutes longer you say i'm better this afternoon and that you'll get me over this bout he said and i believe you but i want you to go a little further and tell me what you think of my case from a general point of view hm muttered the doctor it isn't easy to say what proportion of your symptoms may be temporary and what permanent but ye've a very shabby pair of lungs at this present writing what's your family history my father died of consumption at thirty humph any other relative my aunt a girl of nineteen my father's mother at seven and twenty dear dear that's no very lively retrospect is this your fairest attack of hemorrhage not by three or four the good old doctor shook his head you'll need to take extreme care of yourself he said and you'll no be for spending much of your life in the east country ye might do very well in september and october at rossay or in the isle of arran but i recommend ye to winter in the south do you think i shall be a long-lived man my dear sir that'll depend on care and circumstances beyond human foresight i couldn't conscientiously recommend your life to an insurance office do you think that a man in my condition is justified in marrying do ye want a plain answer the plainest that you can give me then i tell you frankly that i think the marriage of a man with a marked consumptive tendency like yours is a crime a crying sin which is inexcusable in the face of modern science and modern enlightenment and our advanced knowledge of the main springs of life and death what sir can it be less than a crime to bring into this world children burdened with an hereditary curse destined to a heritage of weakness and pain bright young minds fettered by diseased bodies born to perish untimely mr hamley did you ever read a book called ecce homo yes it is a book of books i know it by heart then you may be remember the writer's summing up of a practical christianity as a system of ethics which in its ultimate perfection will result in the happiness of the human race even that last enemy death if not subdued may be made to keep his distance simply by a due observance of natural laws by an unselfish forethought and regard in each member of the human species for the welfare of the multitude the man who becomes the father of a race of puny children can be no friend to humanity he predooms future suffering to the innocent by a reckless indulgence of his own inclination in the present yes i believe you are right said angus with a despairing sigh 
it seems a hard thing for a man who loves and is beloved by the sweetest among women to forego even a few brief years of perfect bliss and go down lonely to the grave to accept this doctrine of renunciation and count himself as one dead in life yet a year ago i told myself pretty much what you have told me to-day i was tempted from my resolve by a woman's loving devotion and now a crucial point has come and i must decide whether to marry or not if you love humanity better than you love yourself ye'll die a bachelor said the scotchman gravely but with infinite pity in his shrewd old face ye've asked me for the truth and i've given it ye truth is often hard argus gave his thin hot hand to the doctor in token of a friendly feeling and then silently turned his face to the wall whereupon the doctor gently patted him upon the shoulder and left him yes it was hard in the bright springtime his health wondrously restored by that quiet restful winter on the shores of the mediterranean angus had almost believed that he had given his enemy the slip that death's dominion over him was henceforth to be no more than over the common ruck of humanity who knowing not when or how the fatal lot may fall from the urn drop into a habit of considering themselves immortal and death a calamity of which one reads in the newspapers with only a kindly interest in other people's mortality all through the gay london season he had been so utterly happy so wonderfully well that the insidious disease which had declared itself in the past by so many unmistakable symptoms seemed to have relaxed its grip upon him he began to have faith in an advanced medical science the power to cure maladies hitherto considered incurable that long interval of languid empty days and nights of placid sleep the heavy sweetness of southern air breathing over fields of orange flowers and violets february roses and carnations had brought strength and healing the foe had been baffled by the new care which his victim had taken of an existence that had suddenly become precious this was the hope that had buoyed up angus hamley's spirits all through the happy springtime and summer which he had spent in the company of his betrothed he had seen the physician who less than a year before had pronounced his sentence of doom and the famous physician taking the thing in the light-hearted way of a man for whom humanity is a collection of cases was jocose and congratulatory full of wonder at his patient's restoration and taking credit to himself for having recommended yeah and now the enemy had him by the throat the foe no longer insidiously hinting at his deadly meaning held him in the fierce grip of pain and fever such an attack as this following upon one summer day's imprudence showed but too plainly by how frail a tie he clung to life how brief and how prone to malady must be the remnant of his days before the post went out he re-read christabel's letter smiling mournfully as he read poor child he murmured to himself god bless her for her innocence god bless her for her unselfish desire to do right if she only knew the truth but better that she should be spared the knowledge of evil what good end would it serve if i were to enter upon painful explanations he had himself propped up with pillows and wrote in a hand which he strove to keep from shaking the following lines dearest i accept your decree not for the reasons which you allege which are no reasons but for other motives which it would pain me too much to explain i have loved you i do love you better than my own joy or comfort better than my own life and it is simply and wholly on that account i can resign myself to say let us in the future be friends and friends only your ever affectionate angus hamley he was so much better next day as to be able to sit up for an hour or two in the afternoon and during that time he wrote at length to mrs tregonell telling her of his illness and of his conversation with the scotch doctor and the decision at which he had arrived on the strength of that medical opinion and leaving her at liberty to tell christabel as much or as little of this as she thought fit i know you will do what is best for my darling's happiness he said if i did not believe this renunciation a sacred duty and the only means of saving her from infinite pain in the future nothing that she or even you could say about my past follies would induce me to renounce her i would fight that question to the uttermost but the other fatal fact is not to be faced except by a blind and cowardly selfishness which i dare not practise after this day the invalid mended slowly and old miss macpherson his aunt being soon quite restored mr hamley telegraphed to his valet to bring books and other necessaries from his chambers in the albany and to meet him in the isle of arran where he meant to vegetate for the next month or two 
chartering a yacht of some kind and living half on land and half on sea end of chapter one chapter two of mount royal volume two by mary elizabeth Braden. this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two alas for me then my good days are done angus hamley's letter came upon christabel like a torrent of cold water as if that bright silvery arc which pierces the rock at st necton's kiev had struck upon her heart with its icy stream and chilled it into stone all through that long summer day upon which her letter must arrive at hillside she had lived in nervous expectation of a telegram expressing indignation remonstrance pleading anger a savage denial of her right to renounce her lover to break her engagement she had made up her mind in all good faith she meant to go on to the bitter end in the teeth of her lover's opposition to complete her renunciation in favour of that frail creature who had so solemn a claim upon angus hamley's honour she meant to fight this good fight but she expected that the struggle would be hard oh how long and dismal those summer hours seemed which she spent in her own room trying to read trying to comfort herself with saddest strains of classic melody and always and through all listening for the telegraph's boy's knock at the hall door or for the sudden stopping of a hansom against the curb bringing home her lover to remonstrate in person in defiance of all calculations of time and space there was no telegram she had to wait nearly twenty-four hours for the slow transit of the mails from the high latitude of inverness and when she read angus hamley's letter those few placid words which so quietly left her free to take her own way her heart sank with a dull despair that was infinitely worse than the keen agonies of the last few days the finality of that brief letter the willingness to surrender her the cold indifference as it seemed to her future fate was the hardest blow of all too surely it confirmed all those humiliating doubts which had tortured her since her discovery of that wretched past he had never really cared for her it was she who had forced him into an avowal of affection by her unconscious revelation of love she who unmaidenly in her ignorance of life and mankind had been the wooer rather than the wooed thank god that my pride and my duty helped me to decide she said to herself what should i have done if i had married him and found out afterwards how weak a hold i had upon his heart if he had told me one day that he had married me out of pity christabel told mrs tregonell she had written to mr hamley she spoke of him only as mr hamley now and had received his reply and that all was now over between them i want you to return his presents for me auntie she said they are too valuable to be sent to his chambers while he is away the diamond necklace which he gave me on my birthday just like the one i saw on the stage i suppose he thinks all women have exactly the same ideas and fancies the books too i will put them all together for you to return he has given you a small library said mrs tregonell i will take the things in the carriage and see that they are properly delivered don't be afraid darling you shall have no trouble about them my own dear girl how brave and good you are how wise too yes bell i am convinced that you have chosen wisely said the widow with the glow of honest conviction for the woof of self-interest is so cunningly interwoven with the warp of righteous feeling that very few of us can tell where the threads cross she drew her knees to her heart and kissed her and cried with her a little and then said cheeringly and now tell me darling what would you like to do we have ever so many engagements for this week and the next fortnight but you know they have been made only for your sake and if you don't care about them care about them oh auntie do you think i could go into society with this dull aching pain at my heart i feel as if i should never care to see my fellow-creatures again except you and jessie and leonard said the mother poor leonard who would go through fire and water for you christabel winced feeling fretfully that she did not want any one to go through fire and water a kind of acrobatic performance continually being volunteered by people who would hesitate at the loan of five pounds where shall we go dear would you not like to go abroad for the autumn switzerland or italy for instance suggested mrs tregonell with an idea that three months on the continent was a specific in such cases no said christabel shudderingly remembering how angus and his frail first love had been happy together in italy oh those books those books 
with their passionate record of past joys those burning lines from byron and hayne which expressed such a world of feeling in ten syllables no i would ever so much rather go back to mount royal my poor child the place is so associated with mr hamley you would be thinking of him every hour of the day i shall do that anywhere change of scene would be so much better for you travelling variety auntie you are not strong enough to travel with comfort to yourself i am not going to drag you about for a fanciful alleviation of my sorrow the landscape may change but not the mind i should think of the past just as much at mont blanc as on willow park no dearest let us go home let me go back to the old old life as it was before i saw mr hamley oh what a child i was in those dear days how happy how happy she burst into tears melted by the memory of those placid days the first tear she had shed since she received her lover's answer and you will be happy again dear don't you remember that passage i read to you in the caxtons a few days ago in which the wise tender-hearted father tells his son how small a space one great sorrow takes in a life and how triumphantly the life soars on beyond it yes i remember but i didn't believe him then and i believe him still less now answered christabel doggedly major brie called that afternoon and found mrs tregonell alone in the drawing-room where is bell he asked she has gone for a long country ride i insisted upon it you were quite right she was looking as white as a ghost yesterday when i just caught a glimpse of her in the next room she ran away like a guilty thing when she saw me well has this cloud blown over is hamley back no christabel's engagement is broken off it has been a great blow a severe trial but now it is over i am glad she never could have been happy with him how do you know that asked the major sharply i judge him by his antecedents what could be expected from a man who had led that kind of life a man who so grossly deceived her deceived her did she ask him if he had ever been in love with an actress did she or you ever interrogate him as to his past life why you did not even question me or i should have been obliged to tell you all i knew of his relations with miss mayne you ought to have told me of your own accord you should not have waited to be questioned said mrs tregonell indignantly why should i stir dirty water do you suppose that every man who makes a good husband and lives happily with his wife has been spotless up to the hour of his marriage there is a sturm und drang period in every man's life depend upon it far better that the tempest should rage before marriage than after i can't accept your philosophy nor could christabel she took the business into her own hands bravely nobly she has cancelled her engagement and left mr hamley free to make some kind of reparation to this actress person reparation to stella Mayne why don't you know that she is the mistress of colonel luscombe who has ruined his social and professional prospects for her sake do you mean to say that old harpy who gave you your information about angus did not give you the epilogue to the play not a word said mrs tregonell considerably dashed by this intelligence but i don't see that this fact alters the case much christabel could never have been happy or at peace with a man who had once been devoted to a creature of that class would you be surprised to hear that creatures of that class are flesh and blood and that they love us and leave us and cleave to us and forsake us just like the women in society asked the major surveying her with mild scorn she was a good woman no doubt and acted honestly according to her lights yet he was angry with her believing that she had spoiled two lives by her incapacity to take a wide and liberal view of the human comedy End of chapter two Chapter three of Mount Royal Volume two by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three Grief a fixed star, and joy a vein that veers. They went back to the Cornish moors and the good old manor house on the hill above the sea went back to the old life just the same in all outward seeming as it had been before that fatal visit which had brought love and sorrow to christabel how lovely the hills looked in the soft summer light 
how unspeakably fair the sea in all its glory of sapphire and emerald and those deep garnet-coloured patches which show where the red seaweed lurks below with its pinnacles of rock and colonies of wild living creatures gull and cormorant basking in the sun little Bocastle, too gay with the coming and going of many tourists the merry music of the guard's horn as the omnibus came jolting down the hill from bodmin or the coach wound up the hill to bood busy with the bustle of tremendous experiments with rockets and life-saving apparatus in a soft july darkness noisy with the lowing of cattle and plaintive tremolo of sheep in the market-place and all the rude pleasures of a rural fair alive with all manner of sound and movement and having a general air of making money too fast for the capability of investment the whole place was gorged with visitors not the inn only but every available bedchamber at post-office shop and cottage was filled with humanity and the half-dozen or so available pony carriages were making the journey to tintagel and back three times a day while the patient investigators who tramped to st necton's kiev without the faintest idea of who st necton was or what a kiev was or what manner of local curiosity they were going to see were legion all coming back ravenous to the same cosy inn to elbow one another in friendly contiguity at the homely table d'hote in the yellow light of many candles christabel avoided the village as much as possible during this gay season she would have avoided it just as much had it been the dull season the people she shrank from meeting were not the strange tourists but the old gaffers and goodies who had known her all their lives the uncles and aunts in cornwall uncle and aunt are a kind of patriarchal title given to honoured age and who might consider themselves privileged to ask why her wedding was deferred and when it was to be she went with jessie on long lonely expeditions by sea and land she had half a dozen old sailors who were her slaves always ready to take her out in good weather deeming it their highest privilege to obey so fair a captain and one who always paid them handsomely for their labour they went often to trebarwith sands and sat there in some sheltered nook working and reading at peace resigned to a life that had lost all its brightness and colour do you know jessie that i feel like an old maid of fifty said bell on one of those rare occasions when she spoke of her own feelings it seems to me as if it were ages since i made up my mind to live and die unmarried and to make life somehow or other self-sufficing as if randy and i were both getting old and grey together for he is ever so much greyer the dear thing she said laying her hand lovingly on the honest black head and grey muzzle what a pity that dogs should grow old so soon when we are so dependent on their love why are they not like elephants in whose lives a decade hardly counts oh bell bell as if a beautiful woman of twenty could be dependent on a sheep-dog's affection when she has all her life before her and all the world to choose from perhaps you think i should change my lover as some people change their dogs said bell bitterly be deeply attached to a collie this year and next year be just as devoted to a spaniel my affections are not so easily transferable mrs tregonell had told her niece nothing of angus hamley's final letter to herself he had given her freedom to communicate as much or as little of that letter as she liked to christabel and she had taken the utmost license and had been altogether silent about it what good could it do for christabel to hear of his illness the knowledge might inspire her to some wild quixotic act she might insist upon devoting herself to him to be his wife in order that she might be his nurse and surely this would be to ruin her life without helping him to prolong his the blow had fallen the sharpest pain of this sudden sorrow had been suffered time and youth and leonard's faithful love would bring swift healing how oh, i loved and grieved for his father thought mrs tregonell yet i survived his loss and had a peaceful happy life with the best and kindest of men a peaceful happy life yes the english matron's calm content in a handsome house and a well-organized household a good stable velvet gowns family diamonds the world's respect but that first passionate love of youth the love that is eager for self-sacrifice that would welcome beggary the love which sees a lover independent of all surrounding circumstances worshipping and defying the man himself that sacred flame had been for ever extinguished in diana champernown's heart before she met burly broad-shouldered squire tregonell at the county ball she wrote to leonard telling him what had happened and that he might now count on the fulfilment of that hope which they both had cherished years ago 
she asked him to come home at once but to be careful that he approached christabel only in a friendly and cousinly character until there had been ample time for these new wounds to heal she bears her trouble beautifully and is all goodness and devotion to me for i have been weak and ailing ever since i came from london but i know the trial is very hard for her the house would be more cheerful if you were at home you might ask one or two of your oxford friends no one goes into the billiard-room now mount royal is as quiet as a prison if you do not come soon dear boy i think we shall die of melancholy mr tregonell did not put himself out of the way to comply with his loving mother's request by the time the widow's letter reached him he had made his plans for the winter and was not disposed to set them aside in order to oblige a lady who was only a necessary detail in his life a man must needs have a mother and as mothers go mrs tregonell had been harmless and inoffensive but she was not the kind of person for whom leonard would throw over elaborate sporting arrangements hired guides horses carts and all the paraphernalia needful for red liver explorations as for christabel mr tregonell had not forgiven her for having set another man in the place which he her cousin and boyish lover in a rough tyrannical way had long made up his mind to occupy the fact that she had broken with the man was a redeeming feature in the case but he was not going into raptures about it nor was he disposed to return to mount royal while she was still moping and regretting the discarded lover let her get over the doldrums and then she and i may be friends again said leonard to his boon companion jack vandeleur not a friend of his university days but an acquaintance picked up on board a cunard steamer son of a half-pay naval captain a man who had begun life in a line regiment fought in afghanistan sold out and lived by his wits and upon his friends for the last five years he had made himself so useful to mr tregonell by his superior experience as a traveller his pluck and knowledge of all kinds of sport that he had been able to live at free quarters with that gentleman from an early stage of their acquaintance thus it was that christabel was allowed to end the year in quietness and peace every one was tender and gentle with her knowing how keenly she must have suffered there was much disappointment among her country friends at the sorry ending of her engagement more especially among those who had been in london during the season and had seen the lovely cornish debutante in her brief day of gladness no one hinted a question to christabel herself the subject of marrying and giving in marriage was judiciously avoided in her presence but mrs tregonell had been questioned and had explained briefly that certain painful revelations concerning mr hamley's antecedents had constrained christabel to give him up every one said it was a pity poor miss courtenay looked ill and unhappy surely it would have been wiser to waive all question of antecedents and to trust to that sweet girl's influence for keeping mr hamley straight in the future antecedents indeed exclaimed a strong-minded matron with five marriageable daughters it is all very well for a young woman like miss courtenay an only child with fifteen hundred a year in her own right to make a fuss about a young man's antecedents but what would become of my five girls if i were to look at things so closely christabel looked at the first column of the times supplement daily to see if there were the advertisement of angus hamley's marriage with stella mayne she was quite prepared to read such an announcement surely now that she had set him free he would make this act of atonement he in all whose sentiments she had perceived so nice a sense of honour but no such advertisement appeared it was possible however that the marriage had taken place without any public notification mr hamley might not care to call the world to witness his reparation she prayed for him daily and nightly praying that he might be led to do that which was best for his soul's welfare for his peace here and hereafter praying for his days whether few or many should be made happy there were times when that delicate reticence which made angus hamley's name a forbidden sound upon the lips of her friends was a source of keenest pain to christabel it would have been painful to hear that name lightly spoken no doubt but this dull dead silence was worse one day it flashed upon her that if he were to die nobody would tell her of his death kindred and friends would conspire to keep her uninformed after this she read the list of deaths in the times as eagerly as she read the marriages but with an agony of fear lest that name as if written in fire should leap out upon the page at last this painful sense of uncertainty as to the fate of one who a few months ago had been a part of her life became unendurable pride withheld her from questioning her aunt or jessie she shrank from seeming small and mean in the sight of her own sex 
she had made her sacrifice of her own accord and there was a poverty of character in not being able to maintain the same spartan courage to the end but from major brie the friend and playfellow of her childhood the indulgent companion of her youth she could bear to accept pity so one mild afternoon in the beginning of october when the major dropped in at his usual hour for tea and gossip she took him to see the chrysanthemums in a house on the further side of the lawn and here having assured herself there was no gardener within hearing she took courage to question him uncle oliver she began falteringly trifling with the fringed petals of a snowy blossom i want to ask you something my dear i think you must know that there is nothing in the world i would not do for you i am sure of that but this is not very difficult it is only to answer one or two questions every one here is very good to me but they make me one mistake they think because i have broken for ever with mr hamley that it can do me no good to know anything about him that i can go on living and being happy while i am as ignorant of his fate as if it were inhabitants of different planets but they forget that after having been all the world to me he cannot all at once become nothing i have still some faint interest in his fate it hurts me like an actual pain not to know whether he is alive or dead she said with a sudden sob my poor pet murmured the major taking her hand in both his own have you heard nothing about him since you left london not one word people make believe that there was never any such person in this world they think it wiser to do so in the hope you will forget him they might as well hope that i shall become a blackamoor said christabel scornfully you have more knowledge of the human heart uncle oliver and you must know that i shall always remember him tell me the truth about him just this once and i will not mention his name again for a long long time he is not dead is he dead no bell what put such a notion into your head silence always seems like death and every one has kept silence about him he was ill when he was in scotland a touch of the old complaint i heard of him at plymouth the other day from a yachting man who met him in the isle of arran after his illness he was all right then i believe ill and i never knew of it dangerously ill perhaps i don't suppose it was anything very bad he had been yachting when my plymouth acquaintance met him he has not married that person faltered christabel what person miss Maine good heavens no my dear nor ever will but he ought it is his duty my dear child that is a question which i can hardly discuss with you but i may tell you at least that there is an all-sufficient reason why angus hamley would never make such an idiot of himself do you mean that she could never be worthy of him that she is irredeemably wicked asked christabel she is not good enough to be any honest man's wife and yet she did not seem wicked she spoke of him with such intense feeling she seemed she spoke repeated the major aghast do you mean to tell me that you have seen that you have conversed with her yes when my aunt told me the story which she heard from lady cumberbridge i could not bring myself to believe it until it was confirmed by miss mayne's own lips i made up my mind that i would go and see her and i went was that wrong very wrong you ought not to have gone near her if you wanted to know more than common rumour could tell you you should have sent me your friend it was a most unwise act i thought i was doing my duty i think so still said christabel looking at him with frank steadfast eyes we are both women if we stand far apart it is because providence has given me many blessings which were withheld from her it is mr hamley's duty to repair the wrong he has done if he does not he must be answerable to his maker for the eternal ruin of a soul i tell you again my dear that you do not understand the circumstances and cannot fairly judge the case you would have done better to take an old soldier's advice before you let the venomous gossip of that malevolent harridan spoil two lives i did not allow myself to be governed by lady cumberbridge's gossip uncle oliver i took nothing for granted it was not till i had heard the truth from miss mayne's lips that i took any decisive step mr hamley accepted my resolve so readily that i can but think it was a welcome release my dear you went to a queer shop for truth 
if you had only known your way about town a little better you would have thought twice before you sacrificed your own happiness in the hope of making miss mayne a respectable member of society but what's done cannot be undone there's no use in crying over spilt milk i dare say you and mr hamley will meet again and make up your quarrel before we are a year older in the meantime don't fret bell and don't be afraid that he will ever marry any one but you i'll be answerable for his constancy the anniversary of christabel's betrothal came round st luke's day a grey october day with a drizzling west country rain she went to church alone for her aunt was far from well and miss bridgman stayed at home to keep the invalid company to read to her and cheer her through the long dull morning perhaps they both felt that christabel would rather be alone on this day she put on her waterproof coat took her dog with her and started upon that wild lonely walk to the church in the hollow of the hills randy was a beast of perfect manners and would lie quietly in the porch all through the service waiting for his mistress she knelt alone just where they two had knelt together there was the humble altar before which they were to have been married the rustic shrine of which they had so often spoken as the fittest place for a loving union fuller of tender meaning than splendid st george's with its fine oaken panelling painted windows and hogarthian architecture never at that altar nor at any other were they two to kneel a little year had held all her hopes and fears her triumphant love joy beyond expression and sadness too deep for tears she went over the record as she knelt in the familiar pew her lips moving automatically repeating the responses her eyes fixed and tearless then when the service was over she went slowly wandering in and out among the graves looking at the grey slate tablets with the names of those whom she had known in life all at rest now old people who had suffered long and patiently before they died a fair young girl who had died of consumption and whose sufferings had been sharper than those of age a sailor who had gone out to a ship with a rope one desperate night and had given his life to save others all at rest now there was no grave being dug to-day she remembered how as she and angus lingered at the gate the dull sound of the earth thrown from the gravedigger's spade had mixed with the joyous song of the robin perched on the gate to-day there was neither gravedigger nor robin only the soft drip drip of the rain on dock and thistle fern and bryony she had the churchyard all to herself the dog following her about meekly crawling over grassy mounds winding in and out among the long wet grass when i die if you have the ordering of my funeral be sure i am buried in minster churchyard that is what angus had said to her one summer morning when they were sitting on the maidenhead coach and even west end london and a london park looked lovely in the clear june light little chance now that she would be called upon to choose his resting place that her hands would fold his in their last meek attitude of submission to the universal conqueror perhaps he will spend his life in italy where no one will know his wife's history thought christabel always believing in spite of major bree's protest that her old lover would sooner or later make the one possible atonement for an old sin nobody except the major had told her how little the lady deserved that such atonement should be made it was mrs tregonell's theory that a well-brought-up young woman should be left in darkest ignorance of the darker problems of life christabel walked across the hill and down by narrow winding ways into the valley where the river swollen and turbid after the late rains tumbled noisily over rock and root and bent the long reeds upon its margin she crossed the narrow footbridge and went slowly through the level fields between two long lines of hills a gorge through which in bleak weather the winds blew fiercely there was another hill to ascend before she reached the field that led to pentargon bay half a mile or so of high road between steep banks and tall unkempt hedges how short and easy to climb that hill had seemed to her in angus hamley's company now she walked wearily and slowly under the softly falling rain wondering where he was and whether he remembered this day she could recall every word that he had spoken and the memory was full of pain for in the light of her new knowledge it seemed to her that all he had said about his early doom had been an argument intended to demonstrate to her why he dared not and must not ask her to be his wife an apology and an explanation as it were and this apology this explanation had been made necessary by her own foolishness by that fatal forgetfulness of self-respect which had allowed her love to reveal itself 
and yet surely that look of rapture which had shone in his eyes as he clasped her to his heart as he accepted the dedication of her young life those tender tones and all the love that had come afterwards could not have been entirely falsehood i cannot believe that he was a hypocrite she said standing where they two had sat side by side in the sunlight of that lovely day gazing at the grey sea smooth as a lake under the low grey sky i think he must have loved me unwillingly perhaps but it was true love while it lasted he gave his first and best love to that other but he loved me too if i had dared to believe him to trust in my power to keep him but no that would have been to confirm him in wrongdoing it was his duty to marry the girl he wronged the thought that her sacrifice had been made to principle rather than to feeling sustained her in this hour as nothing else could have done if she could only know where he was and how he fared and what he meant to do with his future life she could be happier she thought luncheon was over when christabel went back to mount royal but as mrs tregonell was too ill to take anything beyond a cup of beef tea in her own room this fact was of no consequence the mistress of mount royal had been declining visibly since her return to cornwall mr treherne the family doctor told christabel there was no cause for alarm but he hinted also that her aunt was not likely to be a long-lived woman i'm afraid she worries herself he said she is too anxious about that scapegrace son of hers leonard is very cruel answered christabel he lets weeks and even months go by without writing and that makes his poor mother miserable she is perpetually worrying herself about imaginary evils storm and shipwreck runaway horses explosions on steamboats if she would but remember a vulgar adage that naught is never in danger muttered the doctor with whom leonard had been no favourite and then she has frightful dreams about him said christabel my dear miss courtenay i know all about it answered mr treherne your dear aunt is just in that comfortable position of life in which a woman must worry herself about something or other man was born to trouble don't you know my dear the people who haven't real cares are constrained to invent sham ones look at king solomon did you ever read any book that breathes such intense melancholy in every line as that little work of his called ecclesiastes solomon was living in the lap of luxury when he wrote that little book and very likely hadn't a trouble in this world however imaginary cares can kill as well as the hardest realities so you must try to keep up your aunt's spirits and at the same time be sure that she doesn't overexert herself she has a weak heart what we call a tired heart does that mean heart disease faltered christabel with a despairing look well my dear it doesn't mean a healthy heart it is not organic disease nothing wrong with the valves no fear of excruciating pains but it's a rather risky condition of life and needs care i will be careful murmured the girl with white lips as the awful shadow of a grief hardly thought of till this moment fell darkly across a joyless horizon her aunt her adopted mother mother in all sweetest care and love and thoughtful culture might too soon be taken from her then indeed and then only could she know what it was to be alone keenly bitterly she thought how little during the last dismal months she had valued that love almost as old as her life and how the loss of a newer love had made the world desolate for her life without meaning or purpose she remembered how little more than a year ago before the coming of angus hamley her aunt and she had been all the world to each other that tender mother love all sufficing to fill her life with interest and delight in the face of this new fear that sacred love resumed its old place in her mind not for an hour not for a moment of the days to come should her care or her affection slacken not for a moment should the image of him whom she had loved and renounced come between her and her duty to her aunt End of chapter three chapter four of mount royal volume two by mary elizabeth braden this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four love will have his day from this time christabel brightened and grew more like her old self mrs tregonell told herself that the sharp sorrow was gradually wearing itself out no girl with such happy surroundings as christabel's could go on being unhappy for ever 
her own spirits improved with christabel's increasing brightness and the old house began to lose its dismal air until now the widow's conscience had been ill at ease she had been perpetually arguing with herself that she had done right trying to stifle doubts that continually renewed themselves but now she told herself that the time of sorrow was past and that her wisdom would be justified by its fruits she had no suspicion that her niece was striving of set purpose to be cheerful that these smiles and this bright girlish talk were the result of painful effort duty triumphing over sorrow mount royal that winter seemed one of the brightest most hospitable houses in the neighbourhood there were no parties mrs tregonell's delicate health was a reason against that but there was generally some one staying in the house some nice girl whose vivacious talk and whose new music helped to beguile the mother from sad thoughts about her absent son from wearying doubts as to the fulfilment of her plans for the future there were people coming and going old friends driving twenty miles to luncheon and sometimes persuaded to stay to dinner nearer neighbours walking three miles or so to afternoon tea the cheery rector of trevalga and his family friends of twenty years standing were frequent guests mrs tregonell was not allowed to excite herself but she was never allowed to be dull christabel and jessie watched her with unwavering attention anticipating every wish preventing every fatigue a weak and tired heart might hold out for a long time under such tender treatment but early in march there came an unexpected trial in the shape of a sudden and great joy leonard who had never learnt the rudiments of forethought and consideration for others drove up to the house one afternoon in a hired chaise from launceston just as twilight was creeping over the hills and dashed unannounced into the room where his mother and the two girls were sitting at tea who is this gasped mrs tregonell starting up from her low easy-chair as the tall broad-shouldered man bearded bronzed clad in a thick grey coat and big white muffler stood before her and then with a shriek she cried my son my son and fell upon his breast when he placed her in her chair a minute later she was almost fainting and it was some moments before she recovered speech christabel and jessie thought the shock would have killed her oh leonard how could you murmured christabel reproachfully how could i do what come home without one word of notice knowing your mother's delicate health i thought it would be a pleasant surprise for her besides i hadn't made up my mind to come straight home till two o'clock to-day i had half a mind to take a week in town first before i came to this god-forsaken hole you stare at me as if i had no right to be here at all bell leonard my boy my boy faltered the mother with pale lips looking up adoringly at the bearded face so weather-beaten so hardened and altered from the fresh lines of youth if you knew how much i have longed for this hour i have had such fears you have been in such perilous places among savages in all kinds of danger often and often i have dreamt that i saw you dead upon my soul this is a lively welcome said leonard my dearest i don't want to be dismal said mrs tregonell with a faint hysterical laugh her heart was beating tumultuously the hands that clasped her son's were cold and damp my soul is full of joy how changed you are dear you look as if you had gone through great hardships life in the rockies isn't all child's play mother but we've had a jolly time of it on the whole america is a magnificent country i feel deuced sorry to come home except for the pleasure of seeing you and bell let's have a look at you bell and see if you are as much changed as i am step into the light young lady he drew her into the full broad light of a heaped-up wood and coal fire there was very little daylight in the room the tapestry curtains fell low over the heavy mullioned tudor windows and inside the tapestry there was a screen of soft muslin i have not been shooting moose and skunk or living in a tent said christabel with a forced laugh she wanted to be amiable to her cousin wished even to like him but it went against the grain she wondered if he had always been as hateful as this you can't expect to find much difference in me after three years vegetation in cornwall but you've not been vegetating all the time said leonard looking her over as coolly as if she had been a horse you have had a season in london i saw your name in some of the gossiping journals when i was last at montreal you wore a pink gown at sandown 
you were one of the prettiest girls at the royal fancy fair you wore white and tea roses at the marlborough house garden party you have been shining in high places mistress bell i hope it has not spoiled you for country life i love the country better than ever i can vouch for that and you have grown ever so much handsomer since i saw you last i can vouch for that answered her cousin with his free and easy air how do you do miss bridgman he said holding out two fingers to his mother's companion whose presence he had until this moment ignored jessie remembered thackeray's advice and gave the squire one finger in return for his two you're not altered he said looking at her with a steady stare you're the hard-wearing sort warranted fast colour give leonard some tea jessie said mrs tregonell i'm sure you would like some tea looking lovingly at the tall figure the hard handsome face i'd rather have a brandy and soda answered leonard carelessly but i don't mind a cup of tea presently when i've been and had a look round the stables and kennels oh leonard surely not yet said mrs tregonell not yet why i've been in the house ten minutes and you may suppose i want to know how my hunters have been getting on in the last three years and whether the cold nickels bread is good for anything i'll just take a hurried look round and be back again slick mrs tregonell sighed and submitted what could she do but submit to a son who had had his own way and followed his own pleasure ever since he could run alone nay had roared and protested loudly at every attack upon his liberty when he was still in the invertebrate jellyfish stage of existence carried at full length in his nurse's arms with his face turned to the ceiling perpetually contemplating that flat white view of indoor existence which must needs have a depressing influence upon the meditations of infancy the mothers of spirited youths have to fulfil their mission which is for the most part submission how well he looks she said fondly when the squire had hurried out of the room and how he is broadened and filled out jessie bridgman thought within herself that he was quite broad enough before he went to america and that this filling out process had hardly improved him but she held her peace he looks very strong said christabel i could fancy hercules just such a man i wonder whether he has brought home any lion's hides and if he will have one made into a shooting jacket dearest dearest auntie she went on kneeling by the widow's chair i hope you are quite happy now i hope your cup of bliss is full i am very happy sweet one but the cup is not full yet i hope it may be before i die full to the overflowing and that i shall be able to say lord let me depart in peace with a glad and grateful heart leonard came back from the stables in a rather gloomy mood his hunters did not look as well as he expected and the new colt was weak and weedy nichols ought to have known better than to breed such a thing but i suppose he'd say like the man in tristram shandy that it wasn't his fault grumbled mr tregonell as he seated himself in front of the fire with his feet on the brass fender he wore clumped sole boots and a rough heather mixture shooting suit with knickerbockers and coarse stockings and his whole aspect was sporting christabel thought of some one else who had sat before the same hearth in the peaceful twilight hour and wondered if the spiritual differences between these two men were as wide as those of manner and outward seeming she recalled the exquisite refinement of that other man the refinement of the man who is a born dandy who under the most adverse circumstances compelled to wear old clothes and to defy fashion would yet be always elegant and refined of aspect she remembered that outward grace which seemed the natural indication of a poetical mind a grace which never degenerated into effeminacy a refinement which never approached the feeble or the lackadaisical mr tregonell stretched his large limbs before the blaze and made himself comfortable in the spacious plush-covered chair throwing back his dark head upon a cruel antimacassar which was a work of art almost as worthy of notice as a water-colour painting so exquisitely had the flowers been copied from nature by the patient needlewoman this is rather more comfortable than the rockies he said as he stirred his tea with big broad hands scratched and scarred with hard service mount royal isn't half a bad place for two or three months in the year but i suppose you mean to go to london after easter now bell has tasted blood she'll be all agog for a second plunge sandown will be uncommonly jolly this year no we are not going to town this season why not hard up spent all the dollars no but i don't think bell would care about it that's bosh 
come now bell you want to go of course said mr tregonell turning to his cousin no leonard that kind of thing is all very well for once in a lifetime i suppose every woman wants to know what the great world is like but one season must resemble another i should think just like Bocastle fair which i used to fancy so lovely when i was a child till i began to understand that it was exactly the same every year and that it was just possible for one to outgrow the idea of its delightfulness that isn't true about london though there is always something new new clubs new theatres new actors new race meetings new horses new people i vote for may and june in bolton row i don't think your dear mother's health would be equal to london this year leonard said christabel gravely she was angry with this beloved and only son for not having seen the change in his mother's appearance for talking so loudly and so lightly as if there was nothing to be thought of in life except his own pleasure what old lady are you under the weather he asked turning to survey his mother with a critical air this was the american manner of inquiring of her health mrs tregonell when the meaning of the phrase had been explained to her confessed herself an invalid for whom the placid monotony of rural life was much safer than the dissipation of a london season oh very well said leonard with a shrug then you and bell must stop at home and take care of each other and i can have six weeks in london en garçon it won't be worth while to open the house in bolton row i'd rather stop at an hotel but you won't leave me directly after your return leonard no no of course not not till after easter easter's three weeks ahead of us you'll be tired enough of me by that time tired of you after three years absence well you must have got accustomed to doing without me don't you know said leonard with charming frankness when a man has been three years away he can't hurt his friend's feelings much if he dies abroad they've learnt how easy it is to get along without him leonard how can you say such cruel things expostulated his mother with tears in her eyes the very mention of death as among the possibilities of existence scared her there's nothing cruel in it ma'am it's only common sense answered leonard three years well it's a jolly long time isn't it and i dare say to you in this sleepy hollow of a place it seemed precious long but for fellows who are knocking about the world as poker vandeleur and i were time spins by pretty fast i can tell you i'll host in some more sap another cup of tea if you please miss bridgman added leonard handing in his empty cup it's uncommonly good stuff oh here's old randy come here randy randy clutched unceremoniously by the tail and drawn over the hearth rug like any inanimate chattel remonstrated with a growl and a snap he had never been over fond of the master of mount royal and absence had not made his heart grow fonder his temper hasn't improved muttered leonard pushing the dog away with his foot his temper is always lovely when he's kindly treated said christabel making room for the dog in her low armchair whereupon randy insinuated himself into that soft silken nest and looked fondly up at his mistress with his honest brown eyes you should let me give you a pomeranian instead of that ungainly beast said leonard no thanks never any other dog while randy lives randy is a person and he and i have a hundred ideas in common i don't want a toy dog a dog that is only meant for show pomeranians are clever enough for anybody and they are worth looking at i wouldn't waste my affection upon an ugly dog any more than i would on an ugly woman randy is handsome in my eyes said christabel caressing the sheep-dog's grey muzzle i am through said mr tregonell putting down his cup he affected yankee phrases and spoke with a yankee twang america and the americans had suited him down to the ground as he called it their decisive rapidity that go-ahead spirit which charged life with a kind of mental electricity made life ever so much better worth living than in the dull sleepy old world where every one was content with the existing condition of things and only desired to retain present advantages leonard loved sport and adventure action variety he was a tyrant and yet a democrat he was quite willing to live on familiar term with grooms and gamekeepers but not on equal terms he must always be master as much good fellowship as they pleased but they must all knuckle under to him 
he had been the noisy young autocrat of the stable yard and the saddle room when he was still in eton jackets he lived on the easiest terms with the guides and assistants of his american travels but he took care to make them feel that he was their employer and in his own language the biggest boss they were ever likely to have to deal with he paid them lavishly and gave himself the airs of a prince prince henry in the wild falstaffian days before the charge of a kingdom taught him to be grave yet with but too little of henry's gallant spirit and generous instincts three years travel in australia and america had not exercised a refining influence upon leonard tregonell's character or manners blind as the mother's love might be she had insight enough to perceive this and she acknowledged the fact to herself sadly there are travellers and travellers some in whom a wild free life awakens the very spirit of poetry itself whom unrestrained intercourse with nature elevates to nature's grander level some whose mental power deepens and widens in the solitude of forest or mountain whose noblest instincts are awakened by loneliness that seems to bring them nearer god but leonard tregonell was not a traveller of this type away from the restraints of civilization the conventional refinements and smoothings down of a rough character his nature coarsened and hardened his love of killing wild and beautiful things grew into a passion he lived chiefly to hunt and to slay and had no touch of pity for those gracious creatures which looked at their slaughterer reproachfully with dim pathetic eyes wide with a wild surprise at man's cruelty constant intercourse with men coarser and more ignorant than himself dragged him down little by little to a lower grade than he had been born to occupy in all the time that he had been away he had hardly ever opened a book great books had been written poets historians philosophers theologians had given the fruits of their meditations and their researches to the world but never an hour had mr tregonell devoted to the study of human progress to the onward march of human thought when he was within reach of newspapers he read them industriously and learnt from a stray paragraph how some great scientific discovery in science some brilliant success in art had been the talk of the hour but neither art nor science interested him the only papers which he cared about were the sporting papers his travels for the most part had been in wild lonely regions but even in the short intervals that he had spent in cities he had shunned all intellectual amusements he had heard neither concerts nor lectures and had only affected the lowest forms of dramatic art most of his nights had been spent in bar-rooms or groceries playing faro monte poker euchre and falling in pleasantly with whatever might be the most popular form of gambling in that particular city and now he had come back to mount royal having sown his wild oats and improved himself mentally and physically as it was supposed by the outside world by extensive travel and he was henceforward to reign in his father's place a popular country gentleman honourable and honoured useful in his generation a friend to rich and poor nobody had any cause for complaint against him during the first few weeks after his return if his manners were rough and coarse his language larded with american slang his conduct was unobjectionable he was affectionate to his mother attentive in his free and easy way to christabel civil to the old servants and friendly to old friends he made considerable alterations in the stables bought and sold and swapped horses engaged new underlings acted in all out-of-door arrangements as if the place were entirely his own albeit his mother's life interest in the estate gave her the custody of everything but his mother was too full of gladness at his return to object to anything that he did she opened her purse strings freely although his tour had become a costly business her income had accumulated in the less expensive period of his boyhood and she could afford to indulge his fancies he went about with major bree looking up old acquaintances riding over every acre of the estate lands which stretched far away towards launceston on one side towards bodmin on the other he held forth largely to the major on the pettiness and narrowness of an english landscape as compared with that vast continent in which the rivers are as seas and the forests rank and gloomy wildernesses reaching to the trackless and unknown sometimes christabel was their companion in these long rides mounted on the thoroughbred which mrs tregonell gave her on that last too happy birthday the long rides in the sweet soft april air brought health and brightness back to her pale cheeks she was so anxious to look well and happy for her aunt's sake to cheer the widow's fading life but oh 
the unutterable sadness of that ever-present thought of the after-time that unanswerable question as to what was to become of her own empty days when this dear friend was gone happy as leonard seemed at mount royal in the society of his mother and his cousin he did not forego his idea of a month or so in london he went up to town soon after easter took rooms at an hotel near the haymarket and gave himself up to a round of metropolitan pleasures under the guidance of captain vandeleur who had made the initiation of provincial and inexperienced youth a kind of profession he had a neat way of finding out exactly how much money a young man had to dispose of present or contingent and put him through it in the quickest possible time and at the pleasantest pace but he knew by experience that leonard had his own ideas about money and was as keen as experience itself he would pay the current rate for his pleasures and no more and he had a prudential horror of jews post obits and all engagements likely to damage his future enjoyment of his estate he was fond of play but he did not go in the way of losing large sums ponies not monkeys were his favourite animals and he did not care about playing against his chosen friend i like to have you on my side poker he said amiably when the captain proposed a devilled bone and a hand of ecarte after the play you're a good deal too clever for a comfortable antagonist you play ecarte with your other young friends poker and i'll be your partner at whist captain vandeleur who by this time was tolerably familiar with the workings of his friend's mind never again suggested those quiet encounters of skill which must inevitably have resulted to his advantage had leonard been weak enough to accept the challenge to have pressed the question would have been to avow himself a sharper he had won money from his friend at blind hooky but then at blind hooky all men are equal and leonard had accepted the decree of fate but he was not the kind of man to let another man get the better of him in a series of transactions he was not brilliant but he was shrewd and keen and had long ago made up his mind to get fair value for his money if he allowed jack vandeleur to travel at his expense or dine and drink daily at his hotel it was not because leonard was weakly generous but because jack's company was worth the money he would not have paid for a pint of wine for a man who was dull or a bore at mount royal of course he was obliged now and then to entertain bores it was an incident in his position as a leading man in the county but here in london he was free to please himself and to give the cold shoulder to uncongenial acquaintance gay as town was mr tregonell soon tired of it upon this particular occasion after epson and ascot his enjoyment began to wane he had made a round of the theatres he had dined and supped and played a good many nights at those clubs which he and his friends most affected he had spent three evenings watching a great billiard match and he found that his thoughts went back to mount royal and to those he had left there to christabel who had been very kind and sweet to him since his homecoming who had done much to make home delightful to him riding with him playing and singing to him playing billiards with him listening to his stories of travel interested or seemed interested in every detail of that wild free life leonard did not know that christabel had done all this for her aunt's sake in the endeavour to keep the prodigal at home knowing how the mother's peace and gladness depended on the conduct of her son and now in the midst of london dissipations leonard yearned for that girlish companionship it was dull enough no doubt that calm and domestic life under the old roof tree but it had been pleasant to him and he had not wearied of it half so quickly as of this fret and fume and wear and tear of london amusements leonard began to think that his natural bent was towards domesticity and that as bell's husband there could be no doubt that she would accept him when the time came for asking her he would shine as a very estimable character just as his father had shown before him he had questioned his mother searchingly as to bell's engagement to mr angus hamley and was inclined to be retrospectively jealous and to hate that unknown rival with a fierce hatred nor did he fail to blame his mother for her folly in bringing such a man to mount royal how could i suppose that bell would fall in love with him asked mrs tregonell meekly i know how attached she was to you attached yes but that kind of attachment means so little she had known me all her life i was nobody in her estimation no more than the chairs and tables and this man was a novelty and again what has a girl to do in such an out-of-the-way place as this but fall in love with the first comer it is almost the only amusement open to her you ought to have known better than to have invited that fellow here mother 
you knew that i meant to marry bell you ought to have guarded her for me kept off dangerous rivals instead of that you must needs go out of your way to get that fellow here you ought to have come home sooner leonard that's nonsense i was enjoying my life where i was how could i suppose you would be such a fool don't say such hard things leonard think how lonely my life was the invitation to mr hamley was not a new idea i had asked him half a dozen times before i wanted to see him and know him for his father's sake his father's sake a man whom you loved better than ever you loved my father i dare say no leonard that is not true you think not perhaps now my father is dead but i dare say while he was alive you were always regretting that other man nothing exalts a man so much in a woman's mind as his dying look at the affection of widows as compared with that of wives mrs tregonell strove her hardest to convince her son that his cousin's affections were now free that it was his business to win her heart but leonard complained that his mother had spoiled his chances that all the freshness of christabel's feelings must have been worn off in an engagement that had lasted nearly a year she'll have me fast enough i dare say he said with his easy confident air that calm masculine consciousness of superiority as of one who talks of an altogether inferior creature all the faster perhaps on account of having made a fiasco of her first engagement a girl doesn't like to be pointed at as jilt or jilted but i shall always feel uncomfortable about this fellow hamley i shall never be able quite to believe in my wife leonard how can you talk like that you who know christabel's high principles yes but i wanted to be sure that she had never cared for any one but me and you have spoiled my chances of that he stayed little more than a month in london going back to mount royal soon after ascot and while the june roses were still in their glory brief as his absence had been even his careless eye could see that his mother had changed for the worse since their parting the hollow cheek had grown hollower the languid eye more languid the hand that clung so fondly to his broad brown palm was thinner and more waxen of hue his mother welcomed him with warmest love my dearest one she said tenderly this is an unexpected delight it is so good of you to come back to me so soon i want to have you with me dear as much as possible now why mother he asked kindly for a dull pain in his breast seemed to answer to these words of hers because i do not think it will be for long i am very weak dear life seems to be slipping away from me but there is no pain no terror i feel as if i were being gently carried along a slow gliding stream to some sheltered haven which i can picture to myself although i have never seen it i have only one care leonard one anxiety and that is for your future happiness i want your life to be full of joy dearest and i want it to be a good life like your father's yes he was a good old buffer wasn't he said leonard everybody about here speaks well of him but then i dare say that's because he had plenty of money and wasn't afraid to spend it and was an easy master and all that sort of thing don't you know that's a kind of goodness which isn't very difficult for a man to practise your father was a christian leonard a sound practical christian and he did his duty in every phase of life answered the widow half proudly half reproachfully no doubt all i say is that it's uncommonly easy to be a christian under such circumstances your circumstances will be as easy i trust leonard and your surroundings no less happy if you win your cousin for your wife and i feel sure you will win her ask her soon dear ask her very soon that i may see you married to her before i die you think she'll say yes if i do i don't want to precipitate matters and get snubbed for my pains i think she will say yes she must know how my heart is set upon this marriage it has been the dream of my life despite his self-assurance his fixed opinion as to his own personal and social value leonard tregonell hesitated a little at asking that question which must certainly be one of the most solemn inquiries of a man's life his cousin had been all kindness and sweetness to him since his return yet in his inmost heart he knew that her regard for him was at best of a calm cousin quality he knew this but he told himself that if she were only willing to accept him as her husband the rest must follow it would be his business to see that she was a good wife 
and in time she would grow fonder of him no doubt he meant to be an indulgent husband he would be very proud of her beauty grace accomplishments there was no man among his acquaintance who could boast of such a charming wife she should have her own way in everything of course so long as her way did not run counter to his she would be mistress of one of the finest places in cornwall the house in which she had been reared and which she loved with that foolish affection which cats women and other inferior animals feel for familiar habitations altogether as mr tregonell told himself in his simple and expressive language she would have a very good time and it would be hard lines if she were not grateful and did not take kindly to him yet he hesitated considerably before putting the crucial question and at last he took the leap hurriedly and not too judiciously one lovely june morning when he and christabel had gone for a long ride alone they were not in the habit of riding alone and major brie was to have been their companion upon this particular morning but he had sent at the last moment to excuse himself on account of a touch of sciatica they rode early leaving mount royal soon after eight so as to escape the meridian sun the world was still fresh and dewy as they rode slowly up the hill and then down again into the lanes leading towards camelford and there was that exquisite feeling of purity in the atmosphere which wears off as the day grows older my mother is looking rather seedy bell don't you think he began she is looking very ill leonard she has been ill for a long time god grant we may keep her with us a few years yet but i am full of fear about her i go to her room every morning with an aching heart dreading what the night may have brought thank god you came home when you did it would have been cruel to stay away longer that's very good in you bell uncommonly good to talk about cruelty when you must know that it was your fault i stayed away so long my fault what had i to do with it everything i should have been home a year and a half ago home last christmas twelve month i had made all my plans with that intention for i was slightly homesick in those days didn't relish the idea of three thousand miles of everlasting wet between me and those i loved and i was coming across the big drink as fast as a cunard could bring me when i got mother's letter telling me of your engagement then i coiled up and made up my mind to stay in america till i'd done some big licks in the sporting line why should that have influenced you christabel asked coldly why confound it bell you know that without asking you must know that it wouldn't be over pleasant for me to be living at mount royal while you and your lover were spooning about the place you don't suppose i could quite have stomached that do you to see another man making love to the girl i always meant to marry for you know bell i always did mean it when you were in pinafores i made up my mind that you were the future mrs tregonell you did me a great honour said bell with an icy smile and i suppose i ought to be very proud to hear it now perhaps if you had told me your intention while i was in pinafores i might have grown up with a due appreciation of your goodness but you see as you never said anything about it my life took another bent don't chaff bell exclaimed leonard i am in earnest i was hideously savage when i heard that you had got yourself engaged to a man whom you'd only known a week or two a man who had led a rackety life in london and paris stop cried christabel turning upon him with flashing eyes i forbid you to speak of him what right have you to mention his name to me i have suffered enough but that is an impertinence i will not endure if you are going to say another word about him i'll ride back to mount royal as fast as my horse can carry me and get spilt on the way why what a spitfire you are bell i had no idea there was such a spice of the devil in you said leonard somewhat abashed by this rebuff well i'll hold my tongue about him in future i'd much rather talk about you and me and our prospects what is to become of you bell when the poor mother goes you and the doctor have both made up your minds that she's not long for this world for my own part i'm not such a croaker and i've known many a creaking door hanging a precious long time on its hinges still it's well to be prepared for the worst where is your life to be spent bell when the master has sent in her checks heaven knows answered christabel tears welling up in her eyes as she turned her head from the questioner my life will be little worth living when she is gone but i dare say i shall go on living all the same sorrow takes such a long time to kill any one i suppose jessie and i will go on the continent 
and travel from place to place trying to forget the old dear life among new scenes and new people and nicely you will get yourself talked about said leonard with that unhesitating brutality which his friends called frankness a young and handsome woman without any male relative wandering about the continent i shall have jessie a paid companion a vast protection she would be to you about as much as a pomeranian dog or a pole parrot then i can stay in england answered christabel indifferently it will matter very little where i live come bell said leonard in a friendly comfortable tone laying his broad strong hand on her horse's neck as they rode slowly side by side up the narrow road between hedges filled with honeysuckle and eglantine this is flying in the face of providence which has made you young and handsome and an heiress in order that you might get the most out of life is a young woman's life to come to an end all at once because an elderly woman dies that's rank nonsense that's the kind of way widows talk in their first edition of crape and caps but they don't mean it my dear or say they think they mean it they never hold by it that kind of widow is always a wife again before the second year of her widowhood is over and to hear you not quite one and twenty and as fit as a fid in the very zenith of your beauty said leonard hastily correcting the horsey tone of his compliment to hear you talk in that despairing way is too provoking come bell be rational why should you go wandering about switzerland and italy with a shrewish little old maid like jessie bridgman when when you can stay at mount royal and be its mistress i always meant you to be my wife bell and i still mean it in spite of bygones you are very good very forgiving said christabel with most irritating placidity but unfortunately i never meant to be your wife then and i don't mean it now in plain words you reject me if you intend this for an offer most decidedly answered christabel as firm as a rock come leonard don't look so angry let us be friends and cousins almost brother and sister as we have been in all the years that are gone let us unite in the endeavour to make your dear mother's life happy so happy that she may grow strong and well again restored by perfect freedom from care if you and i were to quarrel she would be miserable we must be good friends always if it were only for her sake that's all very well christabel but a man's feelings are not so entirely within his control as you seem to suppose do you think i shall ever forget how you threw me over for a fellow you had only known a week or so and now when i tell you how from my boyhood i have relied upon your being my wife always kept you in my mind as the only woman who was to bear my name and sit at the head of my table you coolly inform me that it can never be you would rather go wandering about the world with a hired companion jessie is not a hired companion she is my very dear friend you choose to call her so but she came to mount royal in answer to an advertisement and my mother pays her wages just like the housemaids you would rather roam about with jessie bridgman getting yourself talked about at every table d'hote in europe a prey for every captain to cease or a loose fish on the continent then you would be my wife and mistress of mount royal because nearly a year ago i made up my mind never to be any man's wife leonard answered christabel gravely i should hate myself if i were to depart from that resolve you mean that when you broke with mr hamley you did not think there was any one in the world good enough to stand in his shoes said leonard savagely and for the sake of a man who turned out so badly that you were obliged to chuck him up you refuse a fellow who has loved you all his life christabel turned her horse's head and went homewards at a sharp trot leaving leonard discomfited in the middle of the lane he had nothing to do but trot meekly after her afraid to go too fast lest he should urge her horse to a bolt and managing at last to overtake her at the bottom of a hill do find some grass somewhere so that we may get a canter she said and her cousin knew that there was to be no more conversation that morning End of chapter four Chapter five of Mount Royal Volume two by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five. But here is one who loves you as of old. After this, Leonard sulked, and the aspect of home life at Mount Royal became cloudy and troubled. 
he was not absolutely uncivil to his cousin but he was deeply resentful and he showed his resentment in various petty ways descending so low as to give an occasional sly kick to randy he was grumpy in his intercourse with his mother he took every opportunity of being rude to miss bridgman he sneered at all their womanly occupations their charities their church-going that domestic sunshine which had so gladdened the widow's heart was gone for ever as it seemed her son now snatched at every occasion for getting away from home he dined at bodmin one night at launceston another he had friends to meet at plymouth and dined and slept at the duke of cornwall he came home bringing worse devils in the way of ill-temper and rudeness than those which he had taken away with him he no longer pretended the faintest interest in christabel's playing confessing frankly that all classical compositions especially those of beethoven suggested to him that far-famed melody which was fatal to the traditional cow he no longer offered to make her a fine billiard player no woman ever could play billiards he said contemptuously they have neither eye nor wrist they know nothing about strengths and always handle their cue as if it was moses rod and was going to turn into a snake and bite em mrs tregonell was not slow to guess the cause of her son's changed humour she was too intensely anxious for the fulfilment of this chief desire of her soul not to be painfully conscious of failure she had urged leonard to speak soon and he had spoken with disastrous result she had seen the angry cloud upon her son's brow when he came home from that tete-a-tete ride with christabel she feared to question him for it was her rash counsel perhaps which had brought this evil result to pass yet she could not hold her peace for ever so one evening when jessie and christabel were dining at trevalca rectory and mrs tregonell was enjoying the sole privilege of her son's company she ventured to approach the subject how altered you have been lately lately meaning for at least a month in your manner to your cousin leonard she said with a feeble attempt to speak lightly her voice tremulous with suppressed emotion has she offended you in any way you and she used to be so very sweet to each other yes she was all honey when i first came home wasn't she mother returned leonard nursing his boot and frowning at the lamp on the low table by mrs tregonell's chair all hypocrisy rank humbug that's what it was she is still bewailing that fellow whom you brought here and mark my words she'll marry him sooner or later she threw him over in a fit of temper and pride and jealousy and when she finds she can't live without him she'll take some means of bringing him back to her it was all your doing mother you spoiled my chances when you brought your old sweetheart's son into this house i don't think you could have had much respect for my dead father when you invited that man to mount royal mrs tregonell's mild look of reproach might have touched the hardest heart but it was lost on leonard who sat scowling at the lamp and did not once meet his mother's eyes it is not kind of you to say that leonard she said gently you ought to know that i was a true and loving wife to your father and that i have always honoured his memory as a true wife should he knew that i was interested in angus hamley's career and he never resented that feeling i am sorry your cousin has rejected you more sorry than even you yourself can be i believe for your marriage has been the dream of my life but we cannot control fate are you really fond of her dear fond of her a great deal too fond foolishly ignominiously fond of her so fond that i am beginning to detest her don't despair then leonard let this first refusal count for nothing only be patient and gentle with her not cold and rude as you have been lately it's easy to talk said leonard contemptuously but do you suppose i can feel very kindly towards a girl who refused me as coolly as if i had been asking her to dance and who let me see at the same time that she is still passionately in love with angus hamley you should have seen how she blazed out at me when i mentioned his name her eyes flaming her cheeks first crimson and then deadly pale that's what love means and even if she were willing to be my wife to-morrow she would never give me such love as that curse her muttered the lover between his clenched teeth i didn't know how fond i was of her till she refused me and now i could crawl at her feet and sue to her as a palavering irish beggar sues for alms cringing and fawning and flattering and lying and yet in my heart of hearts i should be savage with her all the time knowing that she will never care for me as she cared for that other fellow leonard if you knew how it pains me to hear you talk like that 
said mrs tregonell it makes me fearful of your impetuous self-willed nature self will be blank something growled leonard did you ever know a man who cultivated anybody else's will would you have me pretend to be better than i am tell you that i can feel all affection for the girl who preferred the first stranger who came in her way to the playfellow and companion of her childhood if you had been a little less tormenting a little less exacting with her in those days leonard i think she would have remembered you more tenderly said mrs tregonell if you are going to lecture me about what i was as a boy we'd better cut the conversation retorted leonard i'll go and practise the spot stroke for half an hour while you take your after-dinner nap no dear don't go away i don't feel in the least inclined for sleep i had no idea of lecturing you leonard believe me only i cannot help regretting as you do that christabel should not be more attached to you but i feel very sure that if you are patient she will come to think differently by and by didn't you tell me to ask her and quickly yes that was because i was impatient life seemed slipping away from me and i was so eager to be secure of my dear boy's happiness let us try different tactics leo take things quietly for a little behave to your cousin just as if there had been nothing of this kind between you and who knows what may happen i know of one thing that may and will happen next october unless the lady changes her tune answered leonard sulkily what is that i shall go to south america do a little mountaineering in the equatorial andes enjoy a little life in valparaiso Tuxillo, lord knows where i've done north america from canada to frisco and now i shall do the south leonard you would not be so cruel as to leave me to die in my loneliness or i think dear you must know that i have not long to live come mother i believe you fancy yourself ever so much worse than you really are this jog-trot monotonous life of yours would breed vapours in the liveliest person besides if you should be ill while i am away you'll have your niece whom you love as a daughter and perhaps your niece's husband this dear angus of yours to take care of you you are very hard upon me leonard and yet i went against my conscience for your sake i let christabel break with her lover i never said one word in his favour although i must have known in my heart that they would both be miserable i had your interest at heart more than theirs i thought here is a chance for my boy you were very considerate a day after the fair don't you think it would have been better to be wise before the event and not have invited that coxcomb to mount royal he came again and again to the charge always with fresh bitterness he could not forgive his mother for this involuntary wrong which she had done to him after this he went off to the solitude of the billiard-room and a leisurely series of experiments upon the spot stroke it was his only idea of a contemplative evening he was no less sullen and gloomy in his manner to christabel next morning at breakfast for all his mother had said to him overnight he answered his cousin in monosyllables and was rude to randy wondered that his mother should allow dogs in her dining-room albeit randy's manners were far superior to his own later in the morning when christabel and her aunt were alone the girl crept to her favourite place beside mrs tregonell's chair and with her folded arms resting on the cushioned elbow looked up lovingly at the widow's grave sad face auntie dearest you know so well how fondly i love you that i am sure you won't think me any less loving and true if i ask you to let me leave you for a little while let me go away somewhere with jessie to some quiet german town where i can improve myself in music and where she and i can lead a hard-working studious life just like a couple of girton girls you remember last year you suggested that we should travel and i refused your offer thinking that i should be happier at home but now i feel the need of a change and you would leave me now that my health is broken and that i am so dependent on your love said mrs tregonell with mild reproachfulness christabel bent down to kiss the thin white hand that lay on the cushion near her anxious to hide the tears that sprang quickly to her eyes you have leonard she faltered you are happy are you not dearest now leonard is at home again at home yes i thank god that my son is under my roof once more but how long may he stay at home how much do i have of his company in and out all day anywhere but at my side making every possible excuse for leaving me he has begun already to talk of going to south america in the autumn 
poor boy he is restless and unhappy and i know the reason you must know it too bell it is your fault you have spoiled the dream of my life auntie is this generous is this fair pleaded christabel with her head still bent over the pale wasted hand it is natural at least answered the widow impetuously why cannot you care for my boy why cannot you understand and value his devotion it is not an idle fancy born of a few weeks acquaintance not the last new caprice of a battered roue who offers his worn-out heart to you when other women have done with it leonard's is the love of long years the love of a fresh unspoiled nature i know he has not angus hamley's refinement of manner he is not so clever so imaginative but of what value is such surface refinement when the man's inner nature is coarse and profligate a man who has lived among impure women must have become coarse there must be deterioration ruin for a man's nature in such a life as that continued mrs tregonell passionately her resentment against angus hamley kindling as she thought how he had ousted her son why should you not value my boy's love she asked again what is there wanting in him that you should treat him so contemptuously he is young handsome brave owner of this place of which you are so fond your marriage with him would bring the champernown estate together again everybody was sorry to see it divided it would bring together two of the oldest and best names in the county you might call your eldest son champernown tregonell don't auntie don't go on like that entreated christabel piteously if you only knew how little such arguments influence me the glories of our rank and state are shadows not substantial things what difference do names and lands make in the happiness of a life if angus hamley had been a ploughman's son like burns nameless penniless only just himself i should have loved him exactly the same dearest these are the things in which we cannot be governed by other people's wisdom our hearts choose for us in spite of us i have been obliged to think seriously of life since leonard and i had that unlucky conversation the other day he told you about it perhaps he told me that you refused him as i would have refused any other man auntie i have made up my mind to live and die unmarried it is the only tribute i can offer to one i loved so well and who proved so unworthy of your love said mrs tregonell moodily do not speak of him if you cannot speak kindly you once loved his father but you seem to have forgotten that let me go away for a little while auntie a few months only if you like my presence in this house only does harm leonard is angry with me and you are angry for his sake we are all unhappy now nobody talks freely or laughs or takes life pleasantly we all feel constrained and miserable let me go dear when i am gone you and leonard can be happy together no bell we cannot you have spoiled his life you have broken his heart christabel smiled a little contemptuously at the mother's wailing hearts are not so easily broken she said leonard's least of all he is angry because for the first time in his life he finds himself thwarted he wants to marry me and i don't want to marry him do you remember how angry he was when he wanted to go out shooting at eleven years of age and you refused him a gun he moped and fretted for a week and you were quite as unhappy as he was it is almost the first thing i remember about him when he found you were quite firm in your refusal he left off sulking and reconciled himself to the inevitable he will do just the same about this refusal of mine when i am out of his sight but my presence here irritates him christabel if you leave me i shall know that you have never loved me said mrs tregonell with sudden vehemence you must know that i am dying very slowly perhaps a wearisome decay for those who can only watch and wait and bear with me till i am dead but i know and feel that i am dying this trouble will hasten my end and instead of dying in peace with the assurance of my boy's happy future with the knowledge that he will have a virtuous and loving wife a wife of my own training to guide him and influence him for good i shall die miserable fearing that he may fall into evil hands and that evil days may come upon him i know how impetuous how impulsive he is how easily governed through his feelings how little able to rule himself by hard common sense and you who have known him all your life 
who know the best and worst of him you can be so indifferent to his happiness christabel how can i believe in the face of this that you ever loved me his mother i have loved you as my mother replied the girl with her arms around her aunt's neck her lips pressed against that pale thin cheek i love you better than any one in the world if god would spare you for years to come and we could live always together and be all in all to each other as we have been i think i could be quite happy yes i could feel as if there was nothing wanting in this life but i cannot marry a man i do not love whom i never can love he would take you on trust bell murmured the mother imploringly he would be content with duty and good faith i know how true and loyal you are dearest and that you would be a perfect wife love would come afterwards will it make you happier if i don't go away auntie asked christabel gently much happier then i will stay and leonard may be as rude to me as he likes he may do anything disagreeable except kick randy and i will not murmur but you and i must never talk of him as we have talked to-day it can do no good after this came much kissing and hugging and a few tears and it was agreed that christabel should forego her idea of six months study of classical music at the famous conservatoire at leipzig she and jessie had made all their plans before she spoke to her aunt and when she informed miss bridgman that she had given way to mrs tregonell's wish and had abandoned all idea of germany that strong-minded young woman expressed herself most unreservedly you are a fool she exclaimed no doubt that's an outrageous remark from a person in my position to an heiress like you but i can't help it you are a fool a yielding self-abnegating fool if you stay here you will marry that man there is no escape possible for you your aunt has made up her mind about it she will worry you till you give your consent and then you will be miserable ever afterwards i shall do nothing of the kind i wonder that you can think me so weak if you are weak enough to stay you will be weak enough to do the other thing retorted jessie how can i go when my aunt looks at me with those sad eyes dying eyes they are so changed since last year and implores me to stop i thought you loved her jessie i do love her with a fond and grateful affection she was my first friend outside my own home she is my benefactress but i have to think of your welfare christabel your welfare in this world and the world to come both will be in danger if you stay here and marry leonard tregonell i am going to stay here and i am not going to marry leonard will that assurance satisfy you one would think i had no will of my own you have not the will to withstand your aunt she parted you and mr hamley and she will marry you to her son the parting was my act said christabel it was your aunt who brought it about had she been true and loyal there would have been no such parting if you had only trusted to me in that crisis i think i might have saved you some sorrow but what's done cannot be undone there are some cases in which a woman must judge for herself christabel replied coldly a woman yes a woman who has some experience of life but not a girl who knows nothing of the hard real world and its temptations difficulties struggles don't let us talk of it any more i cannot trust myself to speak when i remember how shamefully he was treated christabel stared in amazement the calm practical miss bridgman spoke with a passionate vehemence which took the girl's breath away and yet in her heart of hearts christabel was grateful to her for this sudden flash of anger i did not know you liked him so much that you were so sorry for him she faltered then you ought to have known if you ever took the trouble to remember how good he always was to me how sympathetic how tolerant of my company when it was forced upon him day after day how seemingly unconscious of my plainness and dowdiness why there was not a present he gave me which did not show the most thoughtful study of my taste and fancies i never look at one of his gifts i was not obliged to fling his offerings back in his face as you were without wondering that a fine gentleman could be so full of small charities and delicate courtesy he was like one of those wits and courtiers one reads of in burnett not spotless like tennyson's arthur but the very essence of refinement and good feeling god bless him wherever he is you are very odd sometimes jessie said christabel kissing her friend but you have a noble heart there was a marked change in leonard's conduct when he and his cousin met in the drawing-room before dinner he had been absent at luncheon on a trout-fishing expedition 
but there had been time since his return for a long conversation between him and his mother she had told him how his sullen temper had almost driven christabel from the house and how she had been only induced to stay by an appeal to her affection this evening he was all amiability and tried to make his peace with randy who received his caresses with a stolid forbearance rather than with gratification it was easier to make friends with christabel than with the dog for she wished to be kind to her cousin on his mother's account that evening the reign of domestic peace seemed to be renewed there were no thunderclouds in the atmosphere leonard strolled about the lawn with his mother and christabel looking at the roses and planning where a few more choice trees might yet be added to the collection mrs tregonell's walks now rarely went beyond this broad velvet lawn or the shrubberies that bordered it she drove to church on sundays but she had left off visiting that involved long drives though she professed herself delighted to see her friends she did not want the house to become dull and gloomy for leonard she even insisted that there should be a garden party on christabel's twenty-first birthday and she was delighted when some of the old friends who came to mount royal that day insinuated their congratulations in a tentative manner upon miss courtenay's impending engagement to her cousin there is nothing definitely settled she told mrs st aubyn but i have every hope that it will be so leonard adores her and it would be a much more suitable match for her than the other said mrs st aubyn a commonplace matron of irreproachable lineage it would be so nice for you to have her settled near you would they live at mount royal of course where else should my son live but in his father's house but it is your house do you think i should allow my life interest in the place to stand in the way of leonard's enjoyment of it exclaimed mrs tregonell i should be proud to take the second place in his house proud to see his young wife at the head of his table that is all very well in theory but i have never seen it work out well in fact said the rector of trevalga who made a third in the little group seated on the edge of the wide lawn where sport of youth was playing tennis in half a dozen courts to the enlivening strains of a military band from bodmin barracks how thoroughly happy christabel looks observed another friendly matron to mrs tregonell a little later in the afternoon she seems to have quite got over her trouble about mr hamley yes i hope that is forgotten answered mrs tregonell this garden party was an occasion of unspeakable pain to christabel her aunt had insisted upon sending out the invitations there must be some kind of festival upon her adopted daughter's coming of age the inheritor of lands and money was a person whose twenty-first birthday could not be permitted to slip by unmarked like any other day in the calendar if we were to have no garden party this summer people would say you were broken-hearted at the sad end of last year's engagement darling said mrs tregonell when christabel had pleaded against the contemplated assembly and i know your pride would revolt at that dear auntie my pride has been levelled to the dust if ever i had any it will not raise its head on account of a garden party mrs tregonell insisted albeit even her small share of the preparations the mere revision of the list of guests the discussion and acceptance of jessie bridgman's arrangements was a fatigue to the jaded mind and enfeebled body when the day came the mistress of mount royal carried herself with the old air of quiet dignity which her friends knew so well people saw that she was aged that she had grown pale and thin and wan and they ascribed this change in her anxiety about her niece's engagement there were vague ideas as to the cause of mr hamley's dismissal dim notions of terrible iniquities startling revelations occurring on the very brink of marriage that section of county society which did not go to london knew a great deal more about the details of the story than the people who had been in town at the time and had seen miss courtenay and her lover almost daily for those daughters of the soil who but rarely crossed the tamar the story of miss courtenay's engagement was a social mystery of so dark a complexion that it afforded inexhaustible material for tea-table gossip a story of which no one seemed to know the exact details gave wide ground for speculation and could always be looked at from new points of view and now here was the same miss courtenay smiling upon her friends fair and radiant showing no traces of last year's tragedy in her looks or manners being indeed one of those women who do not wear their hearts upon their sleeves for daws to peck at the local mind therefore arrived at the conclusion that miss courtenay had consoled herself for the loss of one lover by the gain of another and was now engaged to her cousin clara st aubyn ventured to congratulate her upon this happy issue out of bygone griefs i am so glad 
she said squeezing christabel's hand during an inspection of the hothouses i like him so much i don't quite understand replied christabel with a freezing look who is it whom you like the new curate no dear don't pretend to misunderstand me i am so pleased to think that you and your cousin are going to make a match of it he is so handsome such a fine frank open-hearted manner so altogether nice i am pleased to hear you praise him said christabel still supremely cold but my cousin is my cousin and will never be anything more you don't mean that i do without the smallest reservation clara became thoughtful leonard tregonell was one of the best matches in the county and he had always been civil to her they had tastes in common were both horsey and doggy and plain-spoken to brusqueness why should not she be the mistress of mount royal by and by if christabel despised her opportunities at half-past seven the last carriage had driven away from the porch and mrs tregonell thoroughly exhausted by the exertions of the afternoon reclined languidly in her favourite chair moved from its winter place by the hearth to a deep embayed window looking on to the rose garden christabel sat on a stool at her aunt's feet her fair head resting against the cushioned elbow of mrs tregonell's chair well auntie the people are gone and the birthday is over isn't that a blessing she said lightly yes dear it is over and you are of age your own mistress my guardianship expires to-day i wonder whether i shall find any difference in my darling now she is out of leading strings i don't think you will auntie i have not much inclination for desperate flights of any kind what can freedom or the unrestricted use of my fortune give me which your indulgence has not already given what whim or fancy of mine have you ever thwarted no aunt di i don't think there is any scope for rebellion on my part and you will not leave me dear till the end pleaded the widow your bondage cannot be for very long auntie how can you speak like that when you know when you must know that i have no one in the world but you now no one dearest said christabel on her knees at her aunt's feet clasping and kissing the pale transparent hands i have not the knack of loving many people jessie is very good to me and i am fond of her as my friend and companion uncle oliver is all goodness and i am fond of him in just the same way but i never loved any one but you and angus angus is gone from me and if god takes you auntie my prayer is that i may speedily follow you my love that is a blasphemous prayer it implies doubt in god's goodness he means the young and innocent to be happy in this world happy and a source of happiness to others you will form new ties a husband and children will console you for all you have lost in the past no aunt i shall never marry put that idea out of your mind you will think less badly of me for refusing leonard if you understand that i have made up my mind to live and die unmarried but i cannot and will not believe that bell whatever you may think now a year hence your ideas will have entirely altered remember my own history when george hamley died i thought the world so far as it concerned me had come to an end that i had only to wait for death my fondest hope was that i should die within the year and be buried in a grave near his yet five years afterwards i was a happy wife and mother god was good to you said christabel quietly thinking all the while that her aunt must have been made of a different clay from herself there was a degradation in being able to forget it implied a lower kind of organism than that finely strung nature which loves once and once only End of chapter five